All right, today we're going to be covering the physics paper two. This is the extended multiple choice paper. This one's from May, June 2018, and it's variant two. So the course code is 0625 slash 22. This is for the Cambridge IGCSE, which is part of the Cambridge International Examinations. All right then, let's start. And we're ready. Question one. A length of cotton is measured between two points on a ruler. When the length of cotton is wound closely around a pen, it goes around six times. Uh, what distance is once around a pen? Okay, here we've got a measurement showing us uh, two points on a ruler where the total amount of cotton is stretched out. And we can look at the two points on the ruler and find the difference between two, and that will give us the length of the piece of cotton. Now, if I look at this, this is 2.4 centimetres on the left, and on the right, that is 15.6 centimetres. So the total length is 15.6 centimetres minus 2.4 centimetres, which gives us 13.2 centimetres. Now, I know that complete length of string here goes around six times. I want to find out how big it is around once. So I take 13.2 divided by 6, and that will give me a value of 2.2 centimetres. There we go. The answer is option A, 2.2 centimetres. 2. When does an object falling vertically through the air reach terminal velocity? A. When the acceleration of the object becomes negative. B. When the acceleration of the object is equal to G. C. When the air resistance equals weight of the object and D, when the air resistance is greater than the weight of the object. All right, what we've got is a situation here where it's really asking us, when does an object stop accelerating? And we know the resultant force will give us mass times acceleration. Now, initially, when an object starts falling, what it has is just the weight of the object acting. There is no air resistance because it's only just started moving. Over, after a period of time, we've still got the weight, but the air resistance starts to increase a little bit longer. The weight, same value, but the air resistance is getting bigger. And when it reaches the point where the air resistance equals the weight, then the resultant force equals zero because the resultant force is just the weight minus the air resistance. OK, so the answer then is option C. When the air resistance equals the weight, it's reached terminal velocity. It will stop accelerating downwards. It will continue with a constant velocity. 3. A ball is dropped in an evacuated tube. A series of photographs is taken at equal time intervals from the time of release. Another ball of the same size but twice the mass is also dropped in the same evacuated tube and photographed. Which diagram shows the motion of the heavier ball? Alright, so our key point here is actually the fact that this is in an evacuated tube. It's in a vacuum. There's no air resistance, which means that you've got the acceleration due to gravity and no air resistance pushing against that. So both of the balls will move with the same acceleration, which is the acceleration due to gravity. Which means that we would expect the photographs being taken at the same time to show the ball in the same position. So if I just draw a line, so I'd expect to see a ball here. I'd expect to see a ball here. I would expect to see a ball here. And here, we can see, despite my rather terrible line, there's only one possible, possible answer here, which is option B, with the balls behaving exactly the same way. Now, if it wasn't an evacuated tube, things would be different. Air resistance would play a part in the acceleration. But we're dealing with a vacuum here, so there's no air resistance, and the movement of ball B should be the same as the first ball that moves. Question four, which statement about the mass and the weight of an object is correct? Now, do we know, let's put down a relationship that we know between two, weight equals mass times gravity. A, they are both affected by changes in the acceleration of free fall. No, mass is not. So let's just put an X here. They're both forces. Mass is not a force. Uh, they have different units. Well, that's true. One is in kilograms, one is in newtons. And D, weight is calculated by dividing the mass by the acceleration of free fall. Uh, no, weight is mass times the acceleration of free fall, which is gravity. 
so it's not D either. The answer there is C. They have different units. Five, which statement about the mass of an object is correct? So we're on a similar vein here. A, it is equal to the density divided by the volume. Let's see, mass equals density times volume, or density equals mass over volume, however you remember that one. But it certainly isn't density divided by volume. That's wrong. It is equal to the weight multiplied by the gravitational field strength. No. There we are. Probably the weight divided by the gravitational field strength, as we can see from uh, up above. There we are. When we look at that, mass would equal weight over gravity. So it's not that either. So let's just cross that out. There we go. C. It is the effect of a gravitational field on the object. That's not the mass. There we go. And D. It is the property that resists a change in velocity. Well, that's absolutely true. Mass resists change in velocity. There we are. So for five, the answer is D. Six, an object decelerates from 25 meters per second to five meters per second in a time of four seconds. It has a mass of 50 kilograms. What is the resultant force on the object? Okay, a couple of things here. One, force equals mass times acceleration. And two, we can calculate the acceleration here. Acceleration is change in velocity divided by change in time. All right, so the object's decelerating from 25 meters per second to five meters per second. So our change in velocity is final velocity minus initial velocity. So that's five meters per second minus uh, 25 meters per second, all divided by change in time, which is 4.0 seconds. That's 20 divided by four. That will give us a value of five meters per second squared. Specifically, it's negative and it's decelerating. Okay, so it's slowing down. What is the resultant force on the object? Force equals mass times acceleration. So let's carry that through. Uh, we've got a mass of 50 kilograms multiplied by negative five meters per second squared. That gives a value of negative 250 newtons. Aha, look, it's not one of the options, is it? So what does that mean? Well, the negative here is a direction. It's in the opposite way to the positive direction. That's all that means. So the resultant force, if we're looking for a value, 250 newtons. The answer is option C. 7. A beam is pivoted at one end, as shown. The beam weighs 6 newtons and its weight acts at a point x 40 centimetres from the pivot. A force of 4 newtons is applied to the beam, causing it to balance horizontally. OK, so this is what we have. Then we're going to use 4 newtons to get it to balance. In which direction and where is the 4 newtons Newton force applied. So our key points, let's start writing them down. First of all, our clockwise moment equals the anti-clockwise moment. And we know that moment equals force times distance from pivot. That's our turning force here. So let's look at that. We have our clockwise moment, that is uh, force times distance, that's 6.0 newtons multiplied by 0 0.4 meters. And that's going to be equal to our anti-clockwise moment. We know the value of the force. That's 4.0 newtons multiplied by our distance to the pivot. And uh, we don't know what that distance to the pivot is. So I'm just going to have a big X. And I can find the value of big X. Big X equals 6.0 newtons times 0 0.4 meters divided by 4.0 newtons. And that will give me a value of 0 0.6 meters. And this is an anti-clockwise moment. So that means it has to be pointing upwards. Whatever my force is, I know two things. I know the value of the force. It's 4.0 newtons. And I know the distance from the pivot. Here to here is 60 centimetres or 0 0.6 metres. Now, where is it applied? I've got options relating it to x. So I'm going to say it's actually on the right of x by a distance of 20 centimetres. That's the difference between 60 and 40 centimetres. So I'm looking for something which is upwards on the right of x. And there we are. That is option D. Upwards at 20 centimetres to the right of x. 8. A spacecraft is travelling in space with no resultant force and no resultant moment acting on it. So here we are, spacecraft in deep space. Uh, and it's just going this way with no resultant force. 
f equals ma, so a equals 0, because f equals 0. So what do we know about that? Well, its direction is changing. No, it's not. It's in equilibrium. Yeah, it's doing nothing, just going on at constant velocity. Its speed is decreasing. No, you need a resultant force. Its speed is increasing again. No, you need a resultant force. So the option is B. It is in equilibrium. 9. A car of mass 1,000 kilograms travelling at 8 metres per second collides with a lorry of mass 3,000 kilograms that's travelling at 2 metres per second in the same direction. After colliding, the two vehicles stick together. What is the speed after the collision? All right, let's do a little, a little basic picture here of what's happening. We've got a car moving. It has a mass of 1,000 kilograms, and it's moving with a speed of 8 metres per second, and it's going to hit a lorry, or a bigger dot there, which is travelling at 2 metres per second in the same direction, and has a mass of 3,000 kilograms. Well, what do we know about momentum? Well, we know momentum equals mass times velocity. We know momentum is conserved. So let's look at our initial momentum. Our initial momentum will be the momentum of this one plus the momentum of this one. And I'm going to call it uh, momentum I. That's going to be equal to the mass of the car times the velocity of the car plus the mass of the lorry times the velocity of the lorry. So here we go. Our initial momentum will be 8 times 1,000 plus 2 times 3,000. There we go, which will give me a value of 14,000 newton seconds. All right, so let's look at our final momentum, because our final momentum will be mass final times velocity final, and that will be equal to our initial momentum. All right, so what I want to do is find the final velocity. And the final velocity will be the initial momentum, 14,000 newton seconds, divided by the final mass, and they stick together. We've got a plastic collision there, so they've stuck together. And the final mass will be 1,000 kilograms plus 3,000 kilograms. Which is 4,000 kilograms, and that will give me a final answer, there we are, of 3.5 metres per second, which is option C. Question 10. What is the main process by which energy is released in the sun? Well, it's not by alpha decay, it's not by beta decay. Fission is where you take a big nucleus and break it apart. Fusion is where you take small nuclei and squeeze them together under high, high pressures and temperatures. So the answer is D. 11. The work done by a force is related to the magnitude f of the force and the distance moved. In fact, work done is force times distance moved in the direction of the force. So which equation for W is correct? And the answer down here is option D, force times distance. There we are. 12. A crane on a construction site lifts concrete beams. The useful work done by the crane is 4,000 kilojoules in a time of 160 seconds. What is the useful power output of the crane? Okay, well, power equals work done divided by time, which in this case is 4,123 kilojoules. So 4,000 thousand joules divided by 160 seconds. All you have to do is take that, put that into your calculator, and that should give you a nice answer of 25 kilojoules. Option C. 13. A submarine is in water of density 1.0 times 10 to the 3 kilograms per meter cubed. The submarine changes its depth. This causes the pressure on it to change by 0 0.1 megapascals. What is the change in depth of the submarine? Well, what do we know about pressure in a liquid? Pressure in a liquid is density times gravity times height. Now we've got some change in pressure, so that's going to give us density times gravity times change in height. If we want to find change in height, it's going to be the change in pressure divided by density times gravity. So there we go, let's put those numbers in. We have a change in pressure of 0 0.1 megapascals times 10 to the 6 pascals divided by density times gravity. Well, that's 1 times 10 to the 3 uh, 
kilograms per meter cubed multiplied by gravity which is 10 meters per second squared there we are and if we put all those in we get a value of 10 meters which is option b I'm not writing the units in some of these because it's difficult to squeeze everything in the page as we're working it out. 14. An oil tank has a base area of 2.5 metres squared and is filled with oil to a depth of 1.2 metres. Density is 800 kilograms per metre cubed. What is the force exerted on the base of the tank due to the oil? Okay, so again we're dealing with pressure in a liquid here. So we know that pressure in a liquid is rho g h what we can do we're going to put in our information that'll give us the pressure and then we're going to find the force over here and force is just pressure times area there we are all right so let's put that in we've got our first bit pressure in a liquid is density times gravity times height let's put that in density 800 kilograms per meter cubed multiplied by gravity which is 10 meters per second squared multiplied by the height, which is in this case 1.2 meters. There we are. So that works out to give us 9,600 uh, pascals. Okay, so now we need force, which is pressure times area. So the force will be given by 9,600 pascals multiplied by 2.5 meters squared. And that will work out to give me 24,000 newtons which is option D. There we are. Question 15. When molecules of a gas rebound from the wall of a container, the wall experiences a pressure. Uh, what is the cause of the pressure? Is it the change in energy of the molecules? Uh, no. The change in momentum of the molecules? Yes. Forces change in momentum divided by change in time. Change in power of the molecules? Nope. And change in speed of the molecules? No. For all you know, the speed may even remain constant if there good solid elastic collision. Question 16. A student wishes to calibrate a mercury in glass thermometer with a degree Celsius scale. So that should really be degree Celsius but for some reason it's not showing up quite right on my screen. Oh well. Which value should she use for the lower fixed point and the upper fixed point? Okay this is a degree Celsius scale. At that point the lower point is from melting ice and the upper point is from boiling water. That's option B. There we go. The degree Celsius scale is fixed by those two points. Right. 17. In an experiment, an object is heated. The data from the experiment is shown. Uh, we get energy transferred, mass, rise in temperature, and specific heat capacity of the object. Now we're being asked what is the thermal capacity of the object? All right, thermal capacity. You've probably already come across specific heat capacity, certainly should have, which is that energy is mass times specific heat capacity times change in temperature. Now, this is specific heat capacity, that's per kilogram. If you take the mass and multiply it by the specific heat capacity, you get the heat capacity of the object. And this equation up here would just become energy is big C times the change in temperature. So that fixes it to an object as opposed to the little c, which fixes it to a material. All right, so this is what we're looking at. We want to use this equation here. The heat capacity equals mass times specific heat capacity. And we'll put that in and calculate it through. We know the mass of the object, 2.0 kilograms. The specific heat capacity is 150 joules per kilogram per degree Celsius. There we are. All right. So we're going to take those, multiply them together, and that will give us a value of 300 joules per kilogram per degree Celsius. And again, it's not quite showing up right on my screen for some reason. But that's absolutely fine. The answer will be B. 18. Four thermometers with their bulbs painted different colors are placed at equal distances from a radiant heater. Which thermometer shows the slowest temperature rise when the heater is first switched on? So we're looking at one that will heat up the slowest, the one that's the worst at heating up, the best at reflecting heat. In that case, it's a shiny white thermometer. The one's been painted shiny white. 
black matte black specifically is the best absorber um, so that would heat up the fastest then it would be uh, shiny black it would heat up second fastest then matte white and shiny white would heat up the slowest it's the best reflector of the heat question 19 a tank contains water ripples are produced on the surface of the water what causes the ripples to refract the refraction happens when it changes speed you get refraction and diffraction diffraction happens when it spreads out after it passes through a gap refraction happens when it changes speed so a the cold water is replaced with warm water nope the ripples change speed well that's a good start as they move from deep to shallow water yeah that's true they travel more slowly in shallow water the ripples hit the wall of the tank nope and the ripples pass through a narrow, narrow gap nope that would be diffraction not refraction so the answer is b 20 light travels at a speed of 2 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second in a glass block in the glass the wavelength of light is 4 times 10 to the minus 7 meters what is the frequency of the light okay well straight away we need our equation c equals f lambda i'm going to rearrange that to find the frequency frequency is the speed divided by the wavelength which is then 2 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second divided by 4 times 10 to the minus 7 meters there we go and if you put that into your calculator you will get the answer 5 times 10 to the 14 hertz so there we go it's option d excellent 21 scout p signals to scout q on the other side of the valley using a mirror to reflect the sun's light ah now which mirror position will help this to happen well, let's look up here what happens light comes in bounces off the mirror and comes down there so we're looking for a mirror angle that will allow that to happen a would work that would work b it's going to come in and then it's going to bounce back in the same direction c it's going to go off this way the wrong direction and d it's going to go down and hit the ground that's pretty rubbish so the answer we're looking for is option a question 22 a scientist describes light as being monochromatic one color single frequency single wavelength whatever you want to look at it so what does this tell you about the light a it has a single frequency yes more than one wavelength no one wavelength single speed in a single direction doesn't tell you that travels at different speeds in different directions certainly doesn't say that so the option is a it has a single frequency 23 which statement is not correct the speed of long wave infrared radiation in a vacuum is greater than that of short wave well that's not correct light travels at the same speed in a vacuum so my votes already for a let's see the other ones the speed of microwaves in air is approximately the speed of light yep the speed of gamma rays from a sing from a cobalt 60 sample is oh interesting use here 3.0 times 10 to the 5 kilometers per second so that actually is the same as 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second been a bit tricky there by putting kilometers so that's actually correct as well d the x-rays emitted in the supernova explosion reach the earth at the same time as the visible light emitted yep that's right as long as they're both released at the same time so yeah then the answer here is a a is not correct 24 a siren is emitting sound as time passes the sound becomes louder and higher pitched what's happening happening to the amplitude and frequency okay well, as it becomes louder the amplitude increases and higher pitched the frequency increases so they're both increasing and that is option d 25 a permanent magnet is placed close to a bar of soft iron what are the polarities of end p and of end q right well you'll find of course when you put a bar of a bar magnet next to soft iron they attract the reason that happens is because p will become a south pole and q will become a north pole and that's why they attract so the answer there 25 p 
is south, Q is north, is option C. 26. Which method is used to demagnetize a bar magnet? Well, there's a few possibilities. Uh, one, you can heat it up. Two, you can hit it with a hammer. Um, three, you can slowly remove it from uh, an oscillating coil of wire. Of wire, which is an oscillating voltage producing an oscillating uh, magnetic field, you would put it inside and then slowly remove it. So there are three possibilities. Load it into water is not one of our possibilities. Heat it with a Bunsen burner will do the job as long as we heat up above the as long as we heat up above the Curie temperature. C. Place it in a metal box. Sure, you could do that. Wouldn't do anything, but you know, it'd give you so much to store your magnet, I guess. No. D. Suspend it in a sling. Yes, no. Okay, there we go. B. Twenty-seven. What is the EMF of a cell? So. EMF specifically is to do with the, the voltage amount of energy per unit charge. So we're looking for an answer that relates EMF to that. So the amount of energy, uh, so the amount of charge that passes through a cell per unit time doesn't relate to energy. The energy gained per unit charge that passes through the cell, that's quite possible. The total amount of charge flowing through the cell, again, not energy. D, the total energy stored in the cell, no, because it's per unit charge. So the best answer here is B. 28. A student measures the potential difference across the device and the current in the device. Which calculation gives the resistance of the device? Well, what do we know? We know V equals I R. We want resistance. Resistance will just be V divided by I. So it'll be the potential difference divided by the current. So not A, not B, and not D. The answer will be C. Potential difference divided by the current. 29. A piece of wire is 40 centimetres long and has a diameter of 2 millimetres. Its resistance is 0.3 ohms. Which wire of the same material has a resistance of 0 0.15 ohms? So we've got length and we've got diameter. Right, OK, what do we know? We know the resistance is proportional to length over area. And we know that area is proportional to diameter squared. So that's going to be a tricky question. If you're not comfortable with this, don't worry about it at all. A little bit of a tricky one to go through. So far, I'd say this is, uh, by quite some way, maybe the trickiest question on the paper. But let's continue through with that. So I'm looking for a situation where the resistance is proportional to length divided by the diameter squared. This would be my initial result, if I like. If I start changing things, well, you'll see what happens. So let's look at our first one, resistance of A. Resistance of A, I've taken the length, I made it half the size. So I've got one half of L. And the diameter is one half of the size. So diameter squared, that would be one over four times d squared. There we are. So that would actually give me a value of two times l over d squared, which is twice the original resistance. Now I'm looking for something here, which is one half of the original resistance. So it's not a. So I can put that over here. The resistance of b. Well, that's going to be, again, one half L. The diameter increased. It's twice the size. So it's going to be 4 times D squared. By the time we take the 2 and square it, it becomes 4. And that's going to end up with 1 over 8 times L over D squared. So it's an eighth of the original resistance. So it's not that. Again, I'm looking for one half of the original resistance. Next, resistance of C. Well, what do I have? I've taken the length and doubled it, so I've now got 2L divided by 1 half of the diameter, which I then square, that's 1 over 4 of diameter squared, or D squared, which then becomes 8L over D squared. That's 8 times the original value for the resistance, so it's not that. And the last but not least, resistance at point D, that's going to be 2 times L divided by 2D, but that's both squares, so that's 4D squared, which will give me 1 half L over D squared, which is the original, 1 half of the original value of the resistance, which is kind of what I was looking for. Here we go. That's how they relate, 1 half of the original value. So the answer here is D. Now, don't worry if you're not comfortable with it. This is, uh, as I say, by far, the most probably the most tricky question on the paper. 
and it's just one of those ones that this is this question if you like represents the reason why you should do the easy questions first if there's a risk you could suddenly spend 20 minutes in this one question and it's only worth one mark go through the paper do the easy questions first leave this question till the end all right and as far as i'm aware there's no easier way to do it this is how you have to do it this is how you have to approach it with the resistance is proportional to length over area and the trick in this one is that the area is proportional to the square of the diameter and they're working with a diameter here this is generally the sort of question i'd expect to see the next level up and it would still be tricky there so don't worry if you're struggling with it and if you get it right well you know hey congratulations question 30 a diode is used as a rectifier what is the purpose of a rectifier well it allows current to go in one direction only so to allow current to pass in either direction no definitely not that to change alternating current into direct current yeah direct current doesn't mean it's got the same value it just means it's moving in one direction only to switch off the circuit in case of a large current nope and to provide an efficient source of light oh well that doesn't relate to rectifier and uh, doesn't say that the uh, diode is a, is a light emitting diode See, the only way a non-light emitting diode would provide an efficient source of light is uh, if it's about to break so i'm going to go with the no and you wouldn't want that to happen no fireworks and circuits it's a bad idea 31 a student sets up this circuit what is the purpose of this circuit right okay what do we have let's look at this quickly we've got a thermistor here as the temperature increases the resistance decreases the current will then increase and most likely here we've got a bell the bell will sound as the temperature increases okay so when it gets hot the alarm goes a to allow the lamp to be made dimmer or brighter as required there is no lamp b to amplify the sound of a voice no c to light a lamp in the dark definitely not and d to sound a bell when the temperature rises yep there we are option d 32 the diagram shows two voltmeters p and q connected to a potential divider the slight the sliding connection at point x is moved towards the top of the diagram what happens to the reading on p and to the reading on q all right well as this goes up what's going to happen is the voltage across p is going to go down and the voltage across q is going to go up and interestingly enough the voltage across p and the voltage across q if i was to take them and add them together i'd get a constant value and that value would be equal to the voltage up here there we are so the voltage across p would go down and the voltage across q would go up option b 33 the circuit shown contains two gates which truth table describes the operation of the circuit all right you know what let's fill this out i'm going to do this i've got p i've got q and i've got r and let's start with zero zero and i'll just score them out as i go along zero zero uh on q side it goes through a not gate so that becomes a one then i've got one and a zero and going through an OR gate which will be a high it'll be one if either input is equal to one okay so let's look at that p is zero q is zero r has one high input so it's going to give an output that's high one now let's change q so it's p is zero q is one let's come over here let's score out the zero and put in a one let's score in let's score out the one put in a zero now over here at this OR gate we've got two zero inputs that's going to produce a zero output it only produces a high output of one when either input or both are one all right so now let's do the next two inputs for p is one okay we're going to start with q is zero we we'll start with a zero here and that becomes a one over here and the or gate will produce a high output for either or both of them are one so i'll give me a value of one finally we're going to change the value of q to be one which changes the other input to be zero so one one and here we've got one high input to the or gate so it gives a high output so that's the set of results we're looking for all right and that's zero zero one one we're looking for one zero one one on the right hand side one zero one one there we are
option D. That's our answer. 34. In an AC generator, a coil is rotated in a magnetic field and an EMF is induced in the coil. At which position does the EMF has the largest value? Okay, so here's a key point about these things. When we've got something in a magnetic field, north and south, we've got all these magnetic field lines going between one side and the other. And if I've got something which is rotating, some kind of a coil rotating, it'll produce the maximum voltage when it's cutting most magnetic field lines at the same time. So maximum voltage here and minimum voltage here because it's not cutting any of them. There we are. So our answer is A. That's where it's cutting the most magnetic field lines. Thirty-five wire P carries a current directed perpendicularly into the page. A compass is placed at point Q, which is close to wire P. The magnetic field of Q due to the current is very much larger than the magnetic field of Earth. In which direction does the north pole of the compass point? Okay, so here we use a right-hand rule. Thumb points in the same direction as the current is carrying along the wire, which is into the page, and the magnetic field or the magnetic north of the compass will point in the same direction. Our fingers wrap around the wire and. So of course it depends where it is in the wire, but here it's pointing in this direction. And of course if we put the compass here it would point up, if we put the compass over here it would point that way. Yeah, so it changes depending where it is related to the wire. Use the right hand rule to find the right value. 36. A transformer has NP tons in a primary coil and NS tons in the secondary which rule gives the value of NP and NS for a transformer that steps up a voltage of 1200 volts to 36,000 volts? All right, let's write down our equation for transformers. VP over VS equals NP over NS. Now, this is a ratio. So let's carry this through. NP over NS will equal to VP over VS. Let's write in the values for VP and VS. We have... 1200 volts divided by 36,000 volts. There's a couple of ways we can do this. Um, probably the easiest way is just to put this into a calculator and find out the number. And then divide each of these to find out which one gives you the same number. Now doing this, I get a value of 0 0.0333, etc. Now, what I can do is put these values in to find out which one gives me the same value. So 2,000 divided by 60,000 will give me a value of 0 0.033. So this is the right value. We assume that's the answer. But let's just put in the other numbers to double check. 0 0.0033, well, it's not that, that's out. And 60,000 divided by 2,000 will give me a value of 30, it's not that. And 600,000 divided by 2,000 will give me a value oops, of 300. So it's not that either. All right, so the answer is A. Now I mentioned there's another way you could do it. You know that these are the values you want. So what you could do is, say, take 2,000 divided by 1,200. And that will give you a value of 5 divided by 3. Can take that value then 5 over 3 and multiply it by 36,000 volts and that will give you a value of 60,000. There we are. And that will be the number of tons that you would require. So you'd want 2,000 and 60,000. 37. In the atomic model, an atom consists of a central mass orbited by much smaller particles. What is the name of the central mass and the orbiting particles? Well, the central mass there is the nucleus. And the orbiting particles will be electrons. So that's option D. 38. An isotope of polonium has nucleide notation uh, 21884 polonium. This decays by emitting an alpha particle and a beta particle to form X. All right, you know what? Let's write this down because it wants us to find out what the notation is for X. Start with 218 and 84 polonium. And that changes, it gives out um, an alpha particle, which of course is 2 positive and 4 mass, plus a beta particle, 
which is negative one charge and no mass because it's got no neutrons or no protons as well and plus this mysterious particle x and here we've got some kind of uh, proton number p and some mass number m now we want to find out the values so both these numbers at the top and the bottom are conserved so that means that uh, they don't change so 84 equals 2 minus 1 plus p so 84 is basically just p plus 1 p equals 83 and for the other number 218 equals 4 plus 0 plus m so that tells me that m equals 214 so my value for x that i would expect would be 214 on top and 83 on bottom and that is option d 39 the table compares the penetrating abilities and ionizing effects of alpha and beta Oh, sorry, alpha and gamma radiation. Which row is correct? Least penetrating and most ionizing. Well, alpha radiation is the least penetrating. Absolutely. Here we go. So it's one of these ones. And most ionizing is also alpha. In fact, that's actually why it's the least penetrating. Because it takes a lot of energy to ionize things. It's so ionizing it doesn't travel very far. It loses its energy quite quickly by ionizing other things. 40. The graph shows how the count rate registered by a counter near to a sample of radioactive isotope changes over a period of a few days. The background count rate is 5 counts per minute. What is the half-life of the isotope? Alright, so I'm looking at this picture here, and you know what I see? I see this bit here. Why is that important? Because it nicely goes through a couple of points on the graph. That makes my life easier. It starts at a nice point, which is 45, 0, and it goes all the way up to 10 and 6 and that 10 and 6 goes beautifully through a point in the graph now i know the background radiation is 5 so this bit here i just don't really want to care about i would love to subtract that if i was looking at it properly so let's look at that let's look at our initial radioactivity and then our radioactivity after our six days so our initial radioactivity is 45 minus 5 which is 40 counts per minute and after six days it's not the final radioactivity it's just a bit i'm interested in so after six days i end up with 10 minus background radiation that's five counts per minute now this is where it gets interesting what i want to do is a little table of half lives and radioactivity i don't need any units or anything i get at this point because multiple choice paper well, there's no marks for working it out and we'll just try to get through it quickly so half lives we start off no half lives where your radioactivity is the initial one which is 40 after one half life that becomes 20 after two half lives that becomes 10 and after three half lives that becomes five which is interesting because that's what we end up with up here so what does that tell us that tells us because this happens after six days that three half lives equals six days which means that one half-life is two days, which is option B. There we go. All right, well, hopefully you found that useful and ho hopefully you enjoyed that. Well, if you liked it and enjoyed it, please feel free to like and subscribe. And if you have any comments you'd like to make, please make them in the comment section underneath. And you know what? Have a great day.